Lord Jesus, today we thank you that you are the Lord of every storm. We thank you that when we have been in some of the darkest times of our lives and when storms have raged, you've come into the midst of it all. And with one word, peace, be still. We've seen everything around us change because Lord, you are true to your word. You are an ever present help in any time of trouble. So we thank you today for your kindness. We're not imagining this. We're not dreaming this. This is a reality. You care for us. You look after us. You never leave us or forsake us. You comfort us. You help us. You lead us. This is our daily experience, our portion of life. And for that, we will be forever grateful, Lord. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's give Jesus a wonderful applause. And let's show our appreciation to our musicians as well. Wonderful. You may be seated. Fantastic. Well, do you know, when I, was, um, when I was reading Psalm 91 to you this morning, I was prompted to do that in the week uh, because we, we're all very aware of what's happening in our world in the times in which we live. A lot of turbulence and uncertainty and fear and trouble. Lots of messages coming towards us. In fact, uh, Faye and I have been talking to numerous people recently who have changed all of their plans. Their holidays have changed. Their, their, um, their plans have been completely altered as a result of the news feeds and the, the, the trouble that's, that's happening around them in the world. That people are changing all kinds of things that they had planned in response to the messages that they're receiving. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be cautious and we shouldn't be aware of what's happening around us. I'm not, you know, I'm not being critical of that. But what I do want us always to be aware of, and I'm sure you are, is that there is a very real message in the Word of God that comes to encourage us, that, that comes to keep our confidence intact so that we don't sink back under that old spirit of fear because it's got no place in our lives. God has not given us a spirit of fear. That doesn't mean to say that we do stupid things and, you know, we just go running about as if nothing's happening. But God has not given us a spirit of fear. But love, power, and a sound mind. We have a sound mind. And sometimes, you know, when you're bombarded by the messages and by the reality of a world that's at war, a world that has no peace in it. When you're bombarded by that, it's easy for that, that sound mind to get attacked. It's easy for that sound mind to, to get broken apart. And it's, it's easy for us to maybe lose our position of strength that our lives have been founded on. And that's the word of God. Amen. So I believe in these days, whilst there is very real messages that we should be aware of, nothing wrong with that. I believe we must concentrate all of our time into the one message that, that, you know, is our strength. David said, the Lord is my strength and my song. He was in some of the darkest moments of his life when he made statements like that. He said, the Lord is my refuge and my tower. I can run into him and find safety. When there's trouble all around you, when there's fear all around you, there is a refuge of strength that, you, that the, the, the people of God can run to and find safety. Isn't that great news? Isn't that great news? It's wonderful. Do you know, uh, it came back to my mind. You know, when um, we lived in, in Northern Ireland and uh, my dad's here. Dad, stand up a minute. My dad's here. 
Mum and dad come to the church. And, um, you know, my dad, my dad will tell you this. I mean, we're talking real testimonies here. This isn't, you know, um, you know, this isn't some kind of thing that we've dreamt up or concocted. This is reality, life experience. Number of times he's been in situation, very dangerous situations. To look at my dad, you wouldn't think that. But I tell you something now, a man of God, a servant of God, when you love Jesus, when you put Jesus first in your life, let me tell you, all of the promises of God are going to be your portion. All of the promises of God are going to be at your aid and at your disposal. Man came into a meeting once, I mean, he's just preaching a nice, a nice loving message. And a, a, a man, a gunman from the IRA came to kill him. Because they saw an advert, he saw, this IRA guy saw an advert in the local uh, press to say that a Welshman was coming from Wales to preach in a church in Ireland. So the gunman turns up, he's, he's got a loaded gun in his pocket, he's just about to preach his sermon. Everybody was blessed except the, the IRA man. He reaches in to his uh, coat, puts his hand on the gun, and he's ready to fire a bullet at point-blank range, except when he puts his hand on the trigger, his hand paral it gets paralyzed, and he cannot move. My dad gives the appeal for people to come to Christ. The man's hand gets released. His hand goes up in the air. He gets wonderfully born again, and my dad gets to walk out of the building and go home. I'm telling you now, God looks after his people. God protects the righteous. There's safety with him. There really is. And my dad, said to, my dad said to the guy afterwards innocently, he said, oh, it's lovely to see you. Welcome. Why have you come tonight? And the man just openly said, he said, well, well, actually, he said, I came to kill you. And he said, the reason why I came to kill you is because uh, a soldier from the Welsh guards killed my father. And when I saw that you were a Welsh preacher, immediately hatred came into my heart and I wanted to pursue you and shoot you and kill you. Well, God saved that man and he's a wonderful trophy to God's power and to God's grace. No weapon formed against you will prosper, the Bible says. I'm telling you now, this isn't Mickey Mouse here. We're talking about the living word of God. And there's a word over every life here. There's a word and a promise on your life. On another occasion, when we were missionaries in Portugal, my dad was driving home late one night uh, from a meeting. And it was when there was a civil war in Portugal. And the, the, uh, the military was setting up roadblocks all over Portugal to, you know, to stop the terrorists and the militia taking over the country. And you had to stop, obviously, at the checkpoints. They were, they were heavily guarded checkpoints. Well, he's talking to his interpreter. They're having a lovely time in the Lord, singing along. It's the middle of the night. And suddenly, there's a roadblock around the corner. They don't see it. He drives straight through the roadblock. And then, a hundred yards down the road, his interpreter... Dad's interpreter is screaming at him, saying, John, John, you drove through a roadblock. You shouldn't have, do, you shouldn't have done that. Reverse, reverse up, back up. So he backs up, and then suddenly this, uh, this captain starts screaming his head off in Portuguese at my father. And the interpreter began to interpret what the, the captain was, was saying. You shouldn't have gone through the roadblock. Don't you realize there's a shoot-to-kill policy when you drive through a roadblock? And they're all panicking, sorry, sorry. What? And then suddenly the snipers come out of the bushes with their machine guns. And the captain says to the snipers, why didn't you riddle that car with bullets? Why didn't you open fire with your machine guns? Do you know what the sniper said? Sir, we were pressing the trigger repeatedly, but nothing was coming out of the end of the gun. I'm telling you now, God looks after his people. 
This isn't fantasy. This isn't some, you know, kind of concocted story that has no legs. This is an experience of life. Jesus said himself to you and to me, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. There's been countless times in our lives we could testify as a family when we were living in Northern Ireland, suddenly we would be in a street and all of a sudden the voice of the Holy Spirit would say, leave now, we'd leave now. Minutes later there'd be mass explosion and bombs everywhere going off and our lives would be preserved. You see, when you read the Bible, it's applicable to your life. It really is. It really is. So be encouraged, Dad. You can be seated. Come on, let's show our appreciation. <laughs> Fantastic. Dad's nothing special. He'll tell you that himself. That's your portion as much as his portion. It really is. I can remember one day in, um, and this is, has nothing to do with what I'm supposed to be saying this morning. But I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. Because God's not given us a spirit of fear. I remember one day getting up and um, I had to go to work in Port Talbot. I was working in the steelworks there. And all of a sudden, I had this terrible unrest inside. And I thought, I'm not going to work today. And, um, you know, I had, to, I had to make changes to the people who were picking me up. And I said, oh, I'm not going. Well, why aren't you going to work? I don't know. I'm just not going today. I just don't feel, well, you can't just not go to work because you don't feel right. That's not right. Maybe you're having it. You need to go to work. To I'm not going. I knew. You see, the Bible says, let the peace of God rule in your heart. Let it be the umpire. Let the peace of God make the decisions for you in, in the, 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 the everyday situations of life. And the umpire, the peace of God, rose up inside me and said, don't go down there today to Port Talbot. Stay home. Well, I stayed home that very day. Where I was working, the exact location where I was working, there was a huge explosion. And the, the explosion was so big that they cleared the entire site. Now, I'm tell, I don't know what would have happened if I would have been there. I might have been all over Port Talbot. Who knows? All over Wales. But I tell you now, God looks after his children. So don't worry, don't be concerned. And that's not, I'm not trying to make light of what is happening. Please understand, I am not. I think it's absolutely terrible what's happening. And our hearts break and our hearts grieve for people that have lost their loved ones. But on the same hand, our confidence is this, that the Lord is our helper in times of trouble. He looks after us and he keeps us safe, amen? That's just a little encouragement for you today. I'm going to just want to just wanna get into um, something this morning that, um, that the Holy Spirit has given me. You know, it's interesting. I'm always interested how the Holy Spirit brings things together to feed his people. And I've been waiting all week, man, just ready yet, Holy Spirit, to tell me what you're going to say. <sighs> and he just keeps you waiting. He keeps you waiting. Holy Spirit, is it going to be today? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We're getting close to Sunday now, Holy Spirit. Any time now would be good. Friday comes and it's, I've, I'm thinking a few thoughts now and I'm thinking, well, shall I say this? Shan't I say this? Or shall I do this? And then suddenly in the worship yesterday, we're in Hillsong. He arrived and I encountered him and he connected and he said, you say this to my people. Now, many of you may not see it as profound or rocket science. It's simple, but it's from God to encourage you. He 
You know, one day God turned up to a man and he gave him a message, a man in the Old Testament, and it was only eight lines. That's all it was. It was a five-minute message, but it was a five-minute message from God that rocked a nation, that changed a land. So it's not in the amount of words that are spoken that will minister to us and help us, but it's words chosen and given by God that will really make us secure. Do you know, if you've noticed, some of the strong statements around the church here, on the screens, on the website, for instance, this one here, there's no place like home. Another statement that we use, welcome home, are statements that became very important to Faye and I probably a year ago now when we stepped into leading the church here. These were things that God really put on our hearts. Very, very wonderful statements, simple statements, but statements that are very important and we believe chosen by God for us in this house. Really important. Over the next two weeks, I want to unpack the meaning of this, the meaning of these statements that the Lord has, has laid on our hearts for this house. And on beyond there, we're going to go into Christmas, so we may not be concentrating on it too much. But then into next year, again, we're going to unpack it all, all the way through the year. In fact, even beyond that, we're going to just keep unpacking these phrases, welcome home, there's no place like home. Because in just, just a year ago, the Holy Spirit very simply spoke to us. When, we, when, when he started to thrust us into leadership here over the church, he, he, he began to speak to us very, very simply in this. And he said, what you find in your home, I want you to establish in my home. The values that you have in place within your home and the dynamics that work for you in your small household, I want to see working and established in my household. So these are things that are very precious to Faye and I, and we're going to continually review them and speak them. You know, Faye said this morning about connect groups. Dave and Sarah are doing a fantastic job in leading and, and overseeing all of our connect groups. That is the heart. I want to say it to you. That is the heart of this church. If you want to know what the priority of this church is, and probably one of the key things that are going to be important in the future, in this house, it's going to be in our connect groups. If you are not in a connect group, let me encourage you. It's going to be really important for your future to be rooted and planted, not only in what we do here on a Sunday morning corporately, and that is very important, but equally as important as what we do here on a Sunday morning is in our connect groups. If you're not in a connect group, please see Dave and Sarah at the back. We have homes that are waiting to embrace you. Homes that are waiting to welcome you so that you can connect and, and your life can be involved and your life can flourish amidst the lives of others that care for you. I want us to look at what a family really is. What is a family? What is God's intention for the family? You know, you look around our world and you see lots of different pictures and lots of different ideas and lots of different outplays as to what a family is. But God has an intention for what a family should be. All of our families are different. All of our flat families have got different flavors. That's okay. There's not just, you know, there's not necessarily one way to do family. But there are some essential principles in every family that are necessary, if a family is going to be healthy, if a family is going to be strong, if a family is going to be 
flourishing. There are, I believe, some essential principles, some foundations, some ageless laws that must be in place within a family in order for it to thrive and grow and be everything that God intended it to be in its future. One of the things that I find that is very important in our family at home and in our church family here is that is this whole area of dependence. Every person in a family should be dependent. It's right to be dependent. We should be dependent on one another. We, we live in a world that, that champions independence, that promotes independence, that, pro, that, that promotes the superstar culture. Let me tell you, if your family's going to grow, if your family's going to be wholesome, there ain't going to be any superstars in it. There's not going to be one above another. But it's going to be whole, it's going to be healthy, it's going to be balanced. There's no superstars. When I look at our family, our little rugged family, two adults, four children, there's no superstars in that family. There's no one raising itself above another. And if there is, it quickly has to come to an end because the whole of the family has to work and integrate and be dependent on one another if it's going to be everything that God intends it to be. Dependence. Dependence is so important for a family to, to grow and thrive and be everything that God has called it to be. God within himself has this dependence. The Bible talks about God being a trinity. That means Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But you know, the Father doesn't work independently of the Son. The Son doesn't work independently of the Holy Spirit. They're, they're dependent on one another. And it's not always easy for us to understand that, that God is three and yet one. It's not, it's not easy for us to even be able to communicate what that means. But what we do know is this, that there's a dependence, a codependence within the being of God. In that, whenever Father does something, the Son is in it and the Spirit. And whenever the Son does something, the Father's in it and the Spirit's in it. Jesus put it like this one day when he was helping people. He said, I do nothing unless I first see my Father doing it. I, I say nothing, I speak nothing, unless I first hear my father say it. What was he saying? There's a dependence that I have on my father, and I will not work independently of him. There's a, there's a dependence and a unity and an interrelationship that God has within himself that is wonderful, and it's necessary. God is not independent. The Son is not independent from the Spirit, and the Spirit is not independent from the Son. They work together, and there's an interdependence. God said this when he was making man, Genesis 1 verse 26, let us make man in our image. It's almost like he's saying to, it's almost like Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are consulting with one another, and God is saying, let us make man in our image. It's not the father going off on his own thing and he's doing something separate from the son and from the spirit. No, there's a, a unity, an involvement together. Let us make man in our image. Now, this morning, I'm just setting out some foundations, setting out some thoughts so that we understand the necessary the necessity, sorry, of being dependent in a world that says you should be independent. No, no, that's not what family's about. Families have lots of individuals within them. That's what makes them unique. Being an individual is wonderful, but being independent all the time 
can be dangerous. And it can threaten the family that God wants to bring together. No. Yes, we are individuals. But we're dependent individuals upon one another. When a family is full of individuals that want to be independent, can I say to you that that could weaken and threaten the future of that family? If a husband wants to be dependent, if, if I want to be independent to my wife, I'm telling you something now, there's going to be trouble ahead. There's going to be trouble ahead. If I'm doing things independently of Faye, then there's going to be trouble. Why? Because the Bible says that we've been, to, we've been brought together. Let the, two, let the two independents become one. Flesh. Let them depend on one another. Independence is... Listen, independence is at the root. It's at the root of every sin. God said, Genesis 2 verse 18, after he'd made man in his image, in his likeness. So man was a glorious creation of God. It was the pinnacle of everything he did after creating the whole world and the sun and the moon and the stars and the sea and the animals. After doing all of that wonderful stuff, the pinnacle of it all was man because only man was made after his image. Only man was made after his likeness and yet after making Man in his image and his likeness, God said, it's not good for man to be alone. Was God seeing the potential of Adam to become independent? And therefore, he comments, it's not good for man to be, made, to, to, to be alone. So God, in Genesis 2.18 made him a helpmeet, made him somebody that he could be dependent with, made him somebody that he could have relationship with and intimacy with. And Eve came as a helpmeet, as somebody that he could depend upon and somebody that she could depend upon and relationship was born. Dependence was born right there in the beginning. And here we see the importance of it all. And here we see the threat. Satan came and he hated. We know the story. He hated that dependence. He hated that relationship that Adam and he, Eve had and the unity that they had, one with another and with God, and he struck out at it. He tempted Eve she took of the fruit of the tree and suddenly Adam took of it and they're naked and they're hiding under what God had created them to have dominion and rule under, over and they're hiding away and God just comes walking in, in, in the garden. Why? Just to have fellowship with his kids and he can't find them and he begins to ask the question not because he didn't know the answer but because he wanted them to know where they had fallen from. He says, where are you? Adam, Adam, where are you? Adam comes out of hiding. And he said, well, we were hiding. Well, why were you hiding? Well, because we're naked and we feel ashamed. Who's told you that? And they go and they reiterate the story to God. And then this independent Spirit rises up with Adam in self-defense against the loving God that cre had created him and provided everything for him. This independent spirit, this rebellious spirit rises in anger for the first time from Adam in God's face. And in one statement, Adam, from that individualistic spirit, 
criticizes the two most important, precious relationships in his life. He says, it's the woman that you gave me. That's a rebel right there. That's a man that's not dependent anymore. That's a man that's become an individual. That's a man that's become his own man. Suddenly, they leave the garden. And you know, you know that God had planted them in the garden to take care of it. The, the, the word Eden means pleasure, pleasurable, fruitful. And whilst there's a dependence on God and a dependence on one another, there's fruitfulness, there's blessing, there's harmony, there's paradise. And yet as soon as they become hostile towards God and hostile towards one another, and there's chaos and complication, and now they're not necessarily so dependent on one another, they're independent of each other. They, they, they have to leave that place of pleasure they have to leave that place of paradise. And God says, now the world that you're going out into, it's going to produce thorns. The world that you're going out into is, is going to be hard and laborsome. And you're going to get tired. But yet, even in the midst of all of that darkness and chaos and sadness, God promises a savior. And he says to Eve, he says, the woman, the seed of this woman will come and crush the head of Satan, crush the head of the serpent that's made you. Do what you've do, done. And God, right there in the midst of it all, promises a savior. And they go out, and suddenly, what was supposed to be a blessing becomes a curse, you see. Because now it's not only among them as Adults, it's, it's going into family life and they can't even control it. And, and, and down through the years, Cain and Abel, their children grow up. And you've got two sons that are not joining together as brothers. Not joining together as a family. One day they're out in the field and Cain lifts his hand against Abel and he kills his brother. That's a, a man that's not dependent. That's a man that rises up in envy. You see, independence is at the root of every sin. Of every sin. Sin is simply this, separation from God. Sin is simply doing your own thing when you want to do it and living your own way how you want to live it. It's saying, I'm separate from you. I'm an individual. I'm not going to be dependent on you. I'm a self-made person and I'm going to make my own decisions in life. Isaiah 53, Isaiah the prophet puts it like this, talking about everybody everywhere for all time. He says, all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one to his own wicked way. Isaiah right there strikes out at that individualistic nature that was so prevalent in human beings to cause them to be like sheep, to go their own way and scatter and do whatever they want to do. No, God wants us to be dependent on one another. He really does. Jesus said this, A house divided against itself will never stand. A house that is not unified, that has no cohesion together, that is not built in accordance with his pattern and how he designs things will not last, but it will fall. It will not stand. On the other hand, David the psalmist said this, how good it is 
when brothers and sisters dwell together in unity. It's there and then that God commands the blessing. So when the world tell us that it's a weakness to be dependent, that the strength is in being an individual, God conversely says, no, that is not the truth. It's actually, it's actually a strength to be dependent. And when you're dependent upon one another to the point that you're unified, it is there that you will find my blessing. It really is. So God's not about independence. God is about dependence. He really is. I'm going to ask the, I'm going to finish in two minutes. I'm going to keep to time. I'm going to be a good boy. Can I ask uh, James just to come? We're going we're gonna to close and I'm going to, over the weeks, next week and then on beyond that, we're going to look at this. It's so important. We're just setting out a foundation today as to where we're going, a signpost in your mind as to where we're heading towards in all of this. The New Testament is full of people being dependent. Faye said it this morning, the church of God, what he is building, he's bringing living stones together and putting them together side by side, dependent upon one another. This imagery, this language is all over the New Testament and we'll explore it. We will see it so that as we do see it, we will gain a deeper dependence upon one another. And as a result, we'll see the blessing and the life and the, the, the presence of God land on it. All over the New Testament. For instance, in 1 Peter 5, 7, Peter says this to the church. He says, casting all your cares upon Jesus because he cares for you. How many times have you read that and been encouraged by it? Oh my, my. I don't know how many times I've prayed it. I don't know how many times it's been a source of joy to my life. Just that one little line. Oh God, I cast my cares upon you. I cast my burdens on you. Thank you, you care for me. What is that saying? What is Peter saying? Be dependent on Jesus. You haven't got to carry your burdens. Be dependent on Jesus with your life issues, with your life problems. Come on, church, cast your burdens on Him because He cares for you. Be dependent. Don't be independent of Jesus. Don't think that you've just got to work your way through life and work your way through problems and pride and arrogance shuts the door to Him. I'm going to do this my way. I'm going to be an individual. No, humble yourself under the sight of God and say, oh God, I can't do this. I can't get through this problem. I, I can't overcome this obstacle. I'm going to cast my burdens on you. I'm going to involve you. I'm going to say that, do you know what? My life isn't about being dependent. My life is about actually about being completely and utterly dependent on you every minute of the day. And that's what Peter's saying. But my question is this. That's wonderful. I love it. My question is this. What about when you can't cast the burden? Hmm. Jesus said, come unto me, all you are weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. I'll relieve you of your burdens. But what? Is there, is there moments and points in our lives when we can't just cast that burden? We try with all of our life, all of our energy, all of our prayers. We do everything in the book. We get up early, read the Bible, you know, stop eating a meal. Don't have a bar of chocolate for five minutes. Do everything we do and the burden's still there. What happens when you can't cast the burden? Well, the Bible shows us very clearly, really does. 
it shows us very clearly what we should do when we cannot cast our burdens and our cares on the Lord. Galatians 6, verse 2, it says, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. That tells me this, that not only are we to be completely dependent on Jesus with our life issues, with our life problems, but we are to be dependent on one another. When I have a burden on my life that I cannot cast, guess who I need to bear it with me? You! It makes me dependent on you. It makes me necessary to your life and you necessary to my life. And it's what church is all about. It's what family is all about. Can I say this to you as we are closing? We are going to see people come into our family with a, as, we, as, as, as we say welcome home, as we invite them, as the light of this place attracts people in, we are going to see people with huge life issues, huge life problems, and they are not going to have the strength, the faith, the expectation, or the experience to be able to just cast it on Jesus. But that's going to give you and I a reason to bear their burdens with them. And would you, by, by choice, go into the burdens of somebody else's life? Probably not. But the love of Christ within you is going to constrain you and demand that you get in there with them. And your heart will break and the tears will flow. They really will. See, it's not just about casting burdens on the Lord. It's about bearing one another's burdens. If we just cast our burdens on the Lord, we would be independent of one another. But no, the Bible says we're a family, we're a household of God. Just imagine this. I go home, had a great day. Woohoo! On top of the world. Walk in the house and face crying. What's the matter, Faye? Dave, I've had a really ta- sad day, a really difficult day. I've had news today that has really upset me. Now, what if I said this? Faye, cast your burdens on the Lord. He cares for you. And then walk <laughs> off. I'll tell, you what, I'll tell you what message she would get. She wouldn't get a message of, do you know what? I'll cast my burdens on the Lord because he cares for me. She would get a message, Dave doesn't care for me. That's the message she would get. Why? Because she needs me like I need her to bear my burdens. And I bear her burdens. And it's the same corporately as a family, as a church. Let me encourage you. One of the reasons why we love Connect Group is because we go into Claire and Lee's home, we're welcomed, and you know what? It is a connect group, but I don't even think of it as a, as, as a, a cold term like that, connect group. Do you know what I think of it as? I'm going to meet some friends that I love to be with. I'm going to meet some families where, where my children can play and enjoy themselves. I'm going to receive some help. And, and, and some instruction from people's lives that I can get involved with. And I want to encourage you. We, do you know what? I don't want to see anybody on the fringe of this church. I want, us, I want us all to be right at the center, around the table, looking in each other's eyes, not being isolated or separated or independent of one another, but like the Bible tells us we should be, interdependent, connected, like and we'll, we'll do this in a, couple, in a couple of weeks, maybe next week. Like a body. A body. Not a body with parts all over. No life in that. But a body together that's organized and systemized and full of life. Amen. Let's close our eyes a minute. You may be here today and maybe your first time here or it may have been a number of times and 
We sang the songs with us this morning. You've heard me speak. I hope you've understood it. If you haven't, come and see me and I'll try and explain it a bit more. But you may be here today and do you know what? You've been living an independent life. You, you didn't know that there was another life available to you where Jesus could actually be involved in your life. Where Jesus could actually be that one person, God, in your life where you can be dependent upon him. Right now, he is but a prayer away. He really is. And maybe today, for the first time, you want to pray a prayer. I want to help you with that. I want to pray with you. And basically, you're going to be saying this. I'm closing the door on an independent life, and I am choosing to be completely dependent on Jesus, not just for today, but for the rest of my life. And I'm going to make him my savior, and I am going to make him my Lord. If you would like to do that, you may not understand everything, but your heart knows that this is right. I want to pray with you. Pray this quietly. While eyes are closed in respect for this decision you're making, pray this. Jesus, be my Savior. I believe that you died for me to forgive me of my sin, to take away the separation I accept you now into my heart to be my friend and to be my Lord. Amen. Now while eyes are closed, if you prayed that prayer, lift your hand up. I'll see it. We want to give you a little Bible, a little pack. Is there one person here? prayed that prayer. It's a little boy at the back there. That's it. We're all family here this morning, God's family. We stand to our feet. Father, we thank you today for your word to us. We thank you, Lord, that we are your household. You've brought us home. And we thank you that you are making us into a family that's completely dependent on you, yes. But it's dependent on one another too in a wonderful way that's living and that's blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing and then we're going to go. God bless you. Have a great week. Hang around for some tea and coffee at the end. God is...